So, uh, thank you for attending. And um, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who is uh, in a startup or a founder situation or wanting to venture into entrepreneurship? Okay, quite a number of you. Um, uh, and uh, I think hats off to you guys. It's it's a journey that is um, folly, pretty much. I mean, there are so many opportunities for people to navigate their way through life uh, in a fairly comfortable way. And certainly the entrepreneurial journey is, is probably not one of those. Uh, and yet, what is driving you to do this is generally a passion or uh, some sort of fire uh, that takes you away from doing something sensible and doing something that could end up uh, in tears. However, uh, the rewards are uh, the rewards, I think, are intangible in a way. For, for some few, the rewards are, are, are outstanding and, and, uh, and lucrative, uh, but for many, the rewards are really the journey itself and the learning and the relationships and uh, the people that you meet along the way. Uh, and some of the people that you meet along the way are investors, and that's uh, what I want to help you understand. Uh, and uh, the photo up here is... Um, uh, of, uh, of a chap from India talking about a, a, a business that they were trying to build to help people purchase cars in India uh, in, a, in a much more efficient way. So using technology to make a process that was very difficult efficient. Uh, and, um, and that was at a, 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 an incubator called or an accelerator called JFDI, uh, which stands for the Joyful Frog Digital Incubator which was the first full service startup accelerator uh, that opened its doors in Southeast Asia in 2012. And uh, I was invited by them to coach their founders uh, on, on um, pitching. So since 2012 to now, uh, I've learnt a lot uh, and I'm still learning, uh, still acquiring knowledge. Um, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And I'll share that with you today. So um, I think before we go anywhere, we probably need to understand uh, the investment cycle, if you like. So what's the journey? And basically, the first round of funding that you may need to do is, uh, is the angel round, where you're basically looking at proof of concept. And then from there, you graduate if your product works with uh, with customers, or if it looks like it's going to work with customers, then you will start to need uh, uh, further funding. And this is, of course, uh, the alternative to bootstrapping. And, and it also implies that you need capital, <coughs> you need to spend money before you can make money. I mean, that's basically the, the reason you need funding, is because you haven't got any, and you need to spend so that you can create what people can buy. Uh, and bootstrapping is, arguably, it's the best way of building a business. You know, arguably, it's the best way of building a business. But some businesses can't be built that way. And then Series A funding is when you are really able to scale your business. And so one of the um, frameworks for Series A funding that I was exposed to in Singapore was a simple mathematical equation of if your revenue is around $100,000 a month, then you're probably ready for Series A funding. $1.2 million per year revenue. Okay, so this is the sort of money you're looking at in these three stages. And importantly, this is how long it takes. I remember one of the founders of JFDI who was looking for seed funding said, how long is it going to be till we get our funds? And it's like, buddy, <laughs> number one, there's no guarantee you're going to get any funds. And number two, it can take six months to secure the funds and then further months after that before the money comes into your organisation. So it is a, it is a, a, a process that, that goes on. And the further up the, the, the cycle you go, the longer the pitching is. So, you know, if you're thinking about um, uh, seed, uh, you know, like a, if, if you attract seed funds of about, you know, $600,000 or whatever, 
it's like, oh, fantastic, you know, we've got relief. But no, you haven't. You've basically got to start preparing for Series A pretty soon after that. So it's a, it's a really ongoing process and the, the bottom line is this, that it's incredibly competitive. So I spoke to one of the, uh, the fund managers in Singapore, um, uh, Jungle Ventures, and I, I spoke to one of the guys there who's a senior fund manager there. He said that they get 3,000 business plans across their desk every year, 3,000. And they immediately reject around 2,000 of them because they don't fit their mandate. And then from that 1,000, they sift through them and they invest in seven companies a year per average. 3,000 to seven. Seven companies they do. So it's incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, competitive. And if you think about the volume that these people are going through, they're seeing new business opportunities every week. New business opportunities every week at the same time as they're working with their portfolio companies. Okay. So their assessment process, and we'll look at this in a little bit detail later, has to be that they can't be spending ages trying to understand your proposition. And so, you know, this leads us into what, what are you pitching? What do they want to know? And uh, I found this um, quote in a bit of research a couple of years back. What a venture capitalist, what a VC wants is for founders to turn up well prepared with a strong idea, a strong pitch, and a strong case for how the team would execute the idea. Now, there's no magic there. There's no magic there. This is not rocket science. Okay? This is fundamental stuff. This, he said, did not require dressing up as an animal. And the, this, this final sentence was added on to this menu, if you like, because they did have people come in dressed up as animals pitching their idea, you know, which is all decoration and no cake. And so, you know, we don't need to jazz things up. We need to be fundamental in what it is that we pitch. So what do they want to know? What do investors want to know? And what is a strong pitch? Um, one of the early comments about, uh, about it was uh, about what venture capitalists or what investors are looking for is that they're looking for reasons to say no. Investors are looking for reasons to say no to, to an idea. And if you answer their fundamental questions, then you're taking the no away from them. So what are they basically looking for? Uh, so certainly an idea is important. An idea is important. But so is the market. Okay, you have to have a market. And what is a market? What is a market? A market is customers. And customers are people. So how do you define your market? Who are they? And that, to me, raises probably the most fundamental thing of all is, is there demand? Is there demand? The demand comes from the market. You can have a great idea, a great pod product that nobody is really interested in, excited by the idea, but not interested in using it. Who's going to make this happen? And what happens in the world today is that things converge. So you go back to 2006, and when YouTube came along, YouTube was not the first streaming video streaming business idea. There were many before YouTube, many, that failed simply because of bandwidth. But bandwidth became strong enough in 2006 for YouTube to succeed using the compression rates that they developed. And, you know, it's, it's one of the most powerful streaming services still. But it was timing that made that happen. And, and the competitive environment around YouTube, YouTube weren't the only ones. There were other businesses doing the same thing because the same thing was possible. So 
How is your team going to win in this space? Investors want to know that. Why are you the guys that will win in this space when there are so many others capable of doing the same thing? And what's the potential of the business? What's the potential of the business? These are the things that they want to, to know fundamentally. So this is a standard, Google it, you'll find it, investor pitch template, okay? What's the problem? So when you're talking about the problem, you need to be talking about who. Who? It's a question. Answer? Customer. The customer. Absolutely. I've seen so many pitches where people talk about the problem without identifying the customer. They talk about the problem and it's not the customer's problem. They talk about the problem as a concept and there's no relation to the real world. The market is customers who live and breathe, <laughs> whether they're working in an enterprise or whether they're consumers. Solution is your idea of what will fix their problem. And up to that point, problem, solution, fantasy. There is this problem, we have this great solution. Ta-da, billion dollar market. So traction is the evidence that your solution works. We had um, Dave, Dave McClure come to JFDI in the early days. And uh, the boys stood up and started, and girls, not many, in the early days, there were very few girls, lots of girls here, which is great. Uh, the guy stood up to do their pitch, and within 10 seconds, 20 seconds, he'd just say, what's your traction? I'm not, I'm not interested in your story. What's your traction? What's your traction? So absolutely vitally important is that you identify your traction, and your traction can be many, many things. What's the market? What's your business model? Who are you? What's your vision? And vision can be a, 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 a geographic roadmap. Your vision can be a timeline. A vision can be like Amazon. We start with books, but really, we're the everything store. You read the autobiography or the biography of Jeff Bezos. It was always the everything store, always. But to us, it was a bookstore. It was a book play, but for him, it never was. So when he went to investors, the books was the entry point and the vision was the everything store. And then ask, of course, an investor wants to know, what do you want from me? Uh, and uh, yeah, we can talk about that in a little bit more detail later. So what's the product is part of the pitch. What's the opportunity is part of the pitch. And what's your execution? Okay, these are the three fundamental things. So, when we're pitching, uh, what do we do? Uh, and these are mistakes that I've seen time and time again, and I still see them. Uh, it's like, um, sorry, uh, it's, it's like that uh, Gary V says. Um, <laughs> he said, I know that most of the people that I talk to aren't going to do what I say. I know they're not. And like the answers that I have and the, the, the observations that I have, they're nothing new. They're nothing new. These things have been around for forever. Um, so pitching is, uh, is crucial to, to getting your idea across to the investors in a way that whether, it, whether it's your business plan hitting their desk or, or their email in tray, or whether it's at a networking session or whether it's a formal pitch, if it's not clear, it's not going to stick. So pitching is the way that we communicate our ideas and we do it all the time. So I want to start by looking at uh, the master and uh, having a think about what it is that he does well. iMac, iBook, iPod. What is iPod? iPod is an MP3 music player, has CD quality music, but the biggest thing about iPod is it holds a thousand songs. Now this is a quantum leap because it's your, for most people it's their entire music library. This is huge. 
How many times have you gone on the road with a CD player and said, oh God, the CD, I didn't bring the CD I wanted to listen to. But the coolest thing about iPod is that whole, your entire music library fits in your pocket. Okay? You can take your whole music library with you right in your pocket. Never before possible. So that's iPod. Apparently this is being recorded on video, so it, what's being recorded on video at the moment is a dumb show, which is very suitable for me. So what is Steve Jobs doing? What are some observations about his pitching there? Anything, I don't mind what, yes? Yes. Yep. Good. What else? He's not selling technology. <laughs> exactly. He's not selling technology and it's a technical solution. Highly, highly technical. He's telling you how it's going to change your life. Telling you how it's going to change your life, yes? He's very good at reaching the emotional and the personal first before he goes into any information. Yes, so he's connecting with the audience on a personal level in terms of their life experience. Yeah? How many times have you been on the road and that CD you want it just isn't there? And that's like a personal frustration that, that we've felt. So he's connecting with us. If we think about who his audience is, do you know who he was pitching to? He was pitching to us, the customer. Who was in the room? The press, the media. So the people that he was talking to were not the people that he wanted to influence, but they were the people who would write to those people. Yeah? So a thousand songs in your pocket becomes a headline for a tech blogger. You know, your entire music library in your pocket. 10,000 songs in your pocket. All of these different variations he's giving them as words that they can use so that the customer thinks, I would like to do that. Tell me how physically he communicates. What does he do? Sorry? He moves around. In what fashion? Casually, yes. And uh, take that one step further. Um, uh, uses his hands, yes. Yep. Changes the tone of his voice. Sorry? He looks around a bit. If you look at it again, you'll find that there are points when he fixes the audience. And there are times when he doesn't look at them. And there are times when he fixes the audience. Okay, so he's really using his body language to communicate his story. So his body is telling the story. And what can happen with uh, less confident uh, speakers is that the body is telling another story. While we're talking about how fantastic our idea is, we're really uh, frantically trying to scratch an itch that isn't there and we'd really rather be somewhere else. There was a guy in JFDI who was <laughs> six foot four, solid as a rock. He was a kickboxer. He's Polish. He had a beard. He was just a frightening monster. And he stood on the stage and he said, when we talk to CEOs of large multinational corporations, they all tell us they have a problem with information management. And he was like this. All the time his pitch, he'd come to the forward and he'd move back and he just wanted to get off the stage. And so we just said, right, stand still, don't move and tell the audience what you've got to say. When we talk to CEOs of multinational corporations, they all tell us they have a problem with information management. Just a simple thing of controlling your body. And Steve lets it go. He has a casual approach, much the same way as uh, Elon Musk does, just very casual, but it's not casual at all. A thousand songs in your pocket. How many times have you been on the road and the CD you're looking for is just not there? These things are decisions. These things have been arrived at like notes on a music score. And we can actually see that if we were to see Steve Jobs just walking around the stage casually talking without slides, we would think, he's fantastic the way he can just construct a narrative while he's walking around thinking up things. Right? And it's not like that. It is all completely constructed. 
and we see the slides appear and reinforce everything that he says at exactly the right time for exactly the right duration. Every single thing is planned within an inch of its life. So, here's another guy. And I think the point of that is he looks so casual. It looks so fluid. And it's not. And if you've read Steve Jobs' book, the attention that he paid to preparation was intense. It looks like he's not selling, but he's selling. He's selling. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> this is quite different. You had your last chance when ZM got knocked down by a bus, or perhaps it was a tank, and you could have got out and said to the generals, well, we'll help you, guns, food, uniforms, pay for the troops, but you decided, rightly or wrongly, to go in. And now this is 1967, and it's no use asking me now, for my opinion, what you should have done before. All I can say is, we've got to live with today, not with what might have been the day before yesterday. Okay, so the context is 1967. It's um, two years after Singapore's independence, and he's being asked his opinion on Vietnam. And it's not scripted. It's coming straight from his mouth to the question of the interviewer on television in America to an American audience. So how does he come across? What strikes you about that presentation, if you like? Strong. Strong, yep. Sorry? Intelligent. Intelligent, yep. Quite serious. Quite serious. <laughs> yes? No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Okay. He seemed like a talking head. Sorry? He seemed like a talking head. He like seemed... Oh, okay. Okay. Not looking at the audience. Not looking at the audience. No, he's looking at Oh, he's looking into a TV. Well, no, I think you're right. You're right in that sense. So what happens with television is that you've got an interviewer here and a subject there, and you've got a camera here, and so the subject is talking to the person who's asking the question, and the television camera is observing. So, yes, it looks like he's not looking at us. He doesn't look like he's engaging with anyone. He's engaging with his thinking. All right. Yeah. yeah. So there we have uh, different perceptions. My perceptions are completely opposite to both of yours. <laughs> so he comes across to me as somebody with incredible conviction and incredible belief and, as you said, no doubt. And so where does that come from? That comes from he was born into a family that was self-confident anyway. He grew up in Singapore and was there when Japan invaded. He had an incident where he learnt the nature of power and he learnt that he didn't have freedom of speech and he was shut down and lucky that it wasn't as uh, uh, more violent than it was or, or, or even more problematic than that. He educated at university, he went to Oxford, he studied law, he came back to Singapore and he argued the union's case against the, 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 the bosses, if you like, and then he argued Singapore's case against Malaysia for independence. Uh, so by this time, 1967, highly skilled communicator. And the thing that strikes me about Lee Kuan Yew is he has intense belief in what he thinks and what he feels, and he communicates that with no doubt. And you guys are the only people who know your story. Nobody else knows. I don't, have got no clue what you've been working on for the past couple of years. I've got no understanding of, of what you've been de developing and what you're formulating, and, and all of you the same, but you do. You do. You have this foundation of conviction and belief that nobody else has. Nobody. It's your story. And you can present that story with the conviction and the foundation in truth that nobody else can because nobody knows it like you do. And so pitching is an opportunity for you to develop content that allows you to do that. Uh, these are the things that I think 
um, you know, just quickly moving through the physical nature of delivering content, is that you need to have presence. I had some boys in, from uh, Manila and India and they would stand on the stage like this with their shaggy hair and their loose-fitting clothes and, uh, and I said to them, boys, you know, like, you look like a sack of potatoes. You know, it's not good enough. You've got to have a bit more presence about you to engage with people who are choosing, am I going to do this guy, this guy, this guy or that guy? And it's like, the sack of potatoes? I don't think so. So having presence, and presence comes in many forms, uh, but having presence is important. Clarity in the way that you speak your information and in what your information is, and then integrity, you know. We cannot fool anybody anymore. You know, there were times going back 20, 30, 40 years where you could fool people and 10, 15 years later you get found out. Not anymore. Not like that. Yeah? <laughs> we see countless examples of that happening all the time. Uh, in Asia, it's really important that the clarity of your language is, is succinct because you're, you've got Korean people pitching to Indians, you've got Vietnamese people uh, pitching to, Indone uh, to Europeans. So there's all this mix of language, common language is English, and it has to be succinct and it has to be clear. So what are the dangers when we're preparing uh, to pitch? Uh, we leave it to chance, okay? And quite simply, if you're leaving it to chance, it's either going to be like this or it's going to be like that or somewhere in between, okay? So the opportunity that you have is to take control and make sure that it's your best um, presentation of information all the time. This is something that a lot of technology guys, uh, engineers, for example, um, that way inclined have, have a belief that unless you understand everything, you're not going to understand the main thing. But it's, it's not really true if you think about how a car operates. You know, a car gets you from A to B a lot quicker than a horse, for example, in its most rudimentary um, uh, description. And we don't need to know the mechanics of the engine. We don't need to know the relationship of the differential with the, with the tyres. We just need to know that it gets from A to B, a thousand songs in your pocket, it's fine. That's the human experience that I'm looking for. So telling everything about everything is a problem. And having information that is open to interpretation, quite simply, if you have, particularly using general language, which can be interpreted any way, it can be interpreted, say, in one of five ways. Okay? And your way is here, but the audience could be going off, you know, if we just do simple mathematics, 20% of your audience get what you're talking about and the other 80% are thinking it's something different. So having language that is specific and leaving no opportunity for misinterpretation is, is, um, uh, is crucial. And that language needs to be precise as opposed to general. Um, common issues that I've seen in pitches. Okay, really, really common issues. And I was talking about Gary V before. These, these issues, we still see them all the time. We still see them all the time in pitching, which is like, if they're so common, why, why aren't they easily fixed? They just keep coming up. We talk about the product and we don't talk about the business. Okay? So what are investors investing in? Sorry? Business. The business. The business, in a way, apart from their mandate, that, you know, their, their chosen sector, in a way the idea is, you know, to, to say that it's incidental is demeaning. But if it's not going to m give returns, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So where are your returns? So you've got to be able to pitch your business. And I've, like one of the things I do with pitches is I put, put the stopwatch on, I get my notepad, notepad out and I just write down what they pitch and when they change from a problem to a solution or whatever, then I record the time. And you will have pitches that are five minute pitches and at four minutes they're still talking about the problem. Seen that before? <laughs> at four minutes they're still talking about the problem and then they start to go into the solution and then the bell rings. Okay. Uh, managing time, obviously, is crucial. But 
People are in love, and of course you should be. You should be in love with your product. You should be in love with your solution. You're, you're creating it. It's like your own little Frankenstein, you know? It's, it, of course you're going to be in love with that, but the investor is wanting to know what are the returns. As one investor said in Singapore, investors like numbers. Theory versus reality. I touched on this earlier when I said that people talk about the concept of a problem, the concept of a solution, and it's not rooted in human experience. So what's the reality? And Steve Jobs does that so well. How many times have you been in a car and the CD you want to listen to just isn't there? Human experience. His customer's experience. How many times have you been in a car? Not how many times have you been on a plane or how many times have you been on a yacht, or how many times have you been at the tennis club? <laughs> how many times have you been in a car, which everybody has? And then financials. And I had one founder who um, said to me two or three weeks ago as they were preparing for their demo day, but we don't know. We are so early stage. And she was right. We are so early stage. We don't know what our revenues are going to look like. And so what investor is going to invest in a company where the, <laughs> where the founder does not know where their money is going to come from or doesn't think that they know or, or, or can't predict the future? So no one, no one can predict the future. It's all right to be wrong. It's all right to be wrong. A financial model is our idea of if then, if then, if then. If we have a thousand customers and we have this business model, we can generate this revenue in this period of time. If we follow these marketing processes, which have been proven in other business lines, we think we could achieve this. And so for the investor, they're testing their knowledge against yours and they're looking at how you're going to build the business. And you may be wrong. And that doesn't matter. So. Um, one of my great stories about success and failure, I guess, is uh, John Bertrand when he spoke about an America's Cup race. He said, in an America's Cup race, you make a thousand decisions. And if you make 800 of them right, you'll probably win the race. 200 incorrect decisions. 200 failures. But he still wins the race. So that decision making, of course, we can't be right all the time. So, I found this in the paper beginning of last year uh, in Australia. This is the fourth season of Shark Tank and they're still turning up. They don't know their numbers. They can't tell us where they hope to be in the next two or three years. And this is crucial when you're asking for investment because the investment is generally around two or three years. <laughs> so, here's the cash. What's going to happen with with the returns. What are the returns going to look like? So I think that, uh, you know, there, there are ways to express that. What do we think our expenses are going to be against what revenue we could possibly uh, have? What is the actual revenue if we've got customers? And this is classic banking 101. Third quarter 2015, fourth quarter 2015, first quarter 2016, actual. And then we get into the next quarter, Based on that curve, forecast, 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 forecast. Yeah? These are, these are things that are easily done. What does our business look like with investment? What does our business look like without investment? When do we think we might be profitable? So these aren't prescriptive, and there are so many more measures, but financials are giving the investor an understanding of what your business will look like if the things that you are going to do work out favourably. And as I said, they test their knowledge against yours. So whatever field of endeavour you're in, and if that's their mandate, they know it. They absolutely know it. So Jungle Ventures sometimes go to companies and say, we would like to invest in you. We're not looking for investment. Yes, but we think you have a fantastic opportunity and with investment you could do this. So not all investment opportunities come from the founders. They come from the fund managers who are really astute analytical people. Uh, don't tell them a joke because they don't get it. They're sort of... Oh, that's funny. Yes. 
sorry, just a little sidelight there, but uh, they analyse your segment and, and the area that you're playing in. If that's their chosen field, they know it really well. And, uh, and they, that's part of the deal with investors is they can help you build your business. So we need to be able to pitch clearly when we're networking, when we're doing formal presentations, and when we're doing investor meetings, and when we're doing hiring meetings, and when we're doing media opportunities, and we're doing stakeholder meetings, when we're talking to our staff, all the time we're pitching about our business, and if it's not clear, and if it can be misunderstood, it will. So, these are the things you need as a an inventory of communication assets. You need an elevator pitch that succinctly explains your business. You need concise answers for when the questions start to flow. You need a pitch of around six to eight minutes and that's going to be good for a formal pitch session, but it's also going to be good for the beginning of an investor meeting before it gets taken over by their questions. Okay? Uh, you need a pitch deck and you need an investor deck. We'll look at that later. Okay, so for content. Uh, this, I think, is a great description of, uh, uh, of preparing content that is impactful. The single most important thing you need to learn for any job in business is how to communicate, how to write a memo, how to talk, how to think. The easiest way to learn how to do that is to take Journalism 101, newspaper writing, as opposed to magazine writing. Newspaper writing is where you learn to take a particular topic in front of you, hierarchize it from the most important to the least important, so that at any point in time you can chop off the paragraphs from the bottom all the way up and still have something that logically follows through. Magazine writing is where you tell a story. It's a journey. And the climax comes at the end. Every time I get a memo from someone magazine style, I literally tear it up, throw it away, and go back and make them take an online newspaper writing course. Because today, in business, time is money. And when you've got hundreds of decisions to make every week, dozens every day, being able to see and think and understand what the issue is in the first couple of paragraphs is actually paramount to being efficient at what you do. It also is fantastic in problem solving because if you can take the whole issue, distill it down into most of its most important parts, who, what, where, when, why, and how in the first paragraph, and then the next most important part after that, you'll be able to see the big picture and come up with the answer and be the most valuable employee wherever you work. So basically what he's talking about is, is there is an arcane knowledge which describes a framework for categorising information and um, uh, part of the structure of this framework was formulated uh, in journalism as he talks journalism 101. And so in journalism they have this thing called the inverted pyramid. So the lead, which is your headline, is the most important information. And if you look at the categories of the most important information, my five-year-old daughter learnt this recently in primary school in what is an interesting sentence. An interesting sentence is who, what, where, when, why and how. So they were encouraged at five years old to write sentences that had these elements. <laughs> um, the, 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 and, and, and if you think of newspaper um, uh, articles, it's the headline that takes your attention and it's the headline that draws you into the article. And if you're able to succinctly describe what you do in a headline format in a way that people absolutely understand what it is that you're doing, the next thing they're going to do is ask a question, if they need to. If they don't need to, it probably means that they understand what it is that you're doing, which is great. Called the inverted pyramid simply because the least amount of information is the most important information. And the most amount of information, although it's critical, particularly if you're talking about a technology implementation 
or uh, uh, that then in those cases the devil is in the detail. But when you're describing people the, the synthesis of an idea, you really want to be sticking to the, the most important information. When we get to tell everything about everything, that what I spoke about before, the principle there is that there is so much information that it's up to us to sort of navigate our way through it. Uh, an analogy is, is like this, is you take all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and throw them on the table and say, there you go, that's our business. And it's up to the person then to assemble and move all the jigsaw piece, puzzle pieces until they get what the big picture is. And the big picture is that lead, the most important information, if you like. Uh, this is a, a process that artists go through, which is editing, and, and journalists go through, and writers go through, filmmakers go through. You know, filmmakers cut sections out of the film to make it work better. This sculptor had a block of randomly formed rough stone that he fashioned into a beautiful human expression by getting rid of what he doesn't need. And it's fascinating to, whatever your pitch is, whatever your description is, it's an incredible exercise to go through it and just take out everything that you don't need. And what are you left with? General Assembly, are you familiar with General Assembly? Okay, so General Assembly, um, they started off in uh, 2011 uh, in America as a co-working space. And one of the things they used to do was they would hold uh, education events though, as a way of bringing people in to their co-working space. And uh, what they did was in 2012, they pivoted to education. And the type of education they give is in you know, user experience, in design thinking, in different software languages, um, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of, of stuff that people coming out of university sometimes need to learn to be able to do the jobs that, that their education didn't prepare them for. So in five years, 2012 to 17, they uh, went to 20 cities, 35,000 graduates, and one in five Fortune 500 companies. And as they were dealing with enterprise, who has traditionally long sales cycles, they needed, as a startup which needed cash flow, to make this, the, the uh, sales cycle shorter. And they did a number of things, but one of the things I want to highlight that they did is to be able to strongly frame your value proposition, and this was theirs. Source, assess, and train talent. So to be able to walk into an enterprise and say, we source, assess, and train talent. So in your organisation, we can source your talent, we can assess them, and then we can train the ones that have the aptitude that's going to benefit from this education. Very, very simple explanation. How is it structured? Verb, 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 noun. And I'm going to give you guys a minute or two just to think about what it is that you do. Not, what, not how it works or not what it is, but what do you do? What do you do? What does your product or your service or your business do? Uh, in a normal workshop that I run, which is much more interactive than, than we're talking about today, we would share them. But uh, just do this for yourself. I'll devote one minute to it. And the framework is easy. Three verbs and a noun. And the noun is... Maybe the noun is who.
Okay, so continue that if you haven't finished it and test it. Um, uh, Socialising your thoughts is part of the process. It's like the, the decisions that John Bertrand would make. As soon as you share a, a crystallised uh, piece of information with someone, you're going to get immediate feedback. Huh? Or, oh, is uh, generally uh, going to be very helpful. <laughs> um, Thomas Friedman, the, the New York Times uh, writer, has this fantastic saying, uh, and it is, to simplify accurately, you must understand deeply. And so you guys have the deep understanding of what you're doing. And the big challenge is to simplify accurately, and that's the nature of your pitch. So we talked here about what do you do, and so the logical extension of that is the elevator pitch. And here's a really nice description of an elevator pitch from uh, Techstars uh, in their days gone by, when they were an accelerator, not a corporate innovation program. Today we're going to talk about elevator pitches. Now, elevator pitches are fundamental building block to communicating the value of your startup. But so many entrepreneurs suck at it. As soon as you start giving your elevator pitch, what most people hear is, blah, 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 startup, blah, 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 social media platform, blah, 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 API. They're just not listening because entrepreneurs have not figured out how to effectively communicate their elevator pitch. So today, we're going to give you a really quick summary of how to do this effectively. So first of all, what is an elevator pitch? It's a 20 to 30 second summary of your business in one to two sentences. And the goal of an elevator pitch is to effectively communicate what it is that you do and also get engagement from your audience. So you're trying to get questions asked back. So let's talk about the framework for your elevator pitch. So the framework is for customers with problem X, we what you do. So let me say that again. For customers with problem X, we what you do. So let's use a couple examples. Rent Monitor is a company from 2010 Techstars class. Now, if we use this framework, their elevator pitch would look something like this. For landlords who are overcome with the burden of managing rental properties, Rent Monitor provides a web service platform that allows the automation of many commonly occurring manual tasks, such as rent collection and maintenance requests. Let's use a second example, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, Techstars. So if Techstars used this framework for their elevator pitch, it would sound something like this. Startups fail 95% of the time. Techstars provides capital and mentorship in a 13-week boot camp that will turn that 95% failure rate into a 92% success rate. Now notice in both of those examples, I did not use what we are. I always use what we do. And the reason for that is simple, because many people don't understand the lingo of today's technology. So for Techstars, we are a seed accelerator, but I never use that in our elevator pitch. Why? Because if you don't know what a seed accelerator is, you might think, hey, cool, they grow seeds. So always talk about what you do, not what you are. So now that you have the framework down, what you need to do is write down five to ten versions of your elevator pitch and then practice against a real audience. Make sure you're getting feedback from them. Listen to the questions that people ask and iterate on this, on this framework until you've got a really solid pitch. Once the pitch is solid, you want to practice, practice, practice until everybody on your team can say it consistently 100% of the time. Everybody should have it memorized word for word. Once you have that done, then you want to start paying attention to people's questions. So questions are going to be indicative of how well they understand what you're talking about. And you want to practice those answers because clearly a short, succinct answer to a question indicates how well you know your product and your market. So in summary, your elevator pitch should be one to two sentences, no more than 30 seconds max, you want to iterate until solid, practice until consistent, and then practice your answers. And that will give you a very solid elevator pitch. OK, so we talked about what you do. Now, all you simply have to do is define your customers. And the customers are the people who pay for your product, service, offering, whatever it is. So define your customers using precise language. Uh, the worst description I had of an elevator pitch was um, uh, we make sexy websites for people. And so when we sort of dug around into which people are these, uh, 
Um, are they multinational corporations? No, 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 no. Are they individuals? Are they teenagers? Are they kids? No, 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 no. And they were turned out to be small, medium enterprise. Sorry, small, medium businesses in Singapore were who they made their sexy websites for. And what do you mean sexy? Was it lingerie? No, 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 no. Cool. And so the language that they used was open to interpretation and easy to misinterpret. So, who are your customers? Who are the people who will pay for your service? And what is the problem that they have? So if you've got customers and you've got what you do, that's great, but if the customers don't have a problem, why would they use it? Okay, so you've got two minutes now to define your customers, define their problem, and use what you do as the basis of your solution. Okay, that'll do for now. Same as with the other exercise, if you haven't finished, continue working on it. Uh, and these exercises are, it's in a way, it's starting at the opposite end of how we usually approach what we pitch. What we usually try to do when we pitch is tell everything that we think we need, people need to know. And here you're telling only, only the essentials. And it's a different approach, it's a different discipline. So if we were to take this to the investor pitch, the exercise that I do with founders is this. Give me a single statement that defines each of these areas. So your traction, it may be customers that are paying. Your traction may be letters of intent. Your traction may be a memorandum of understanding. Your traction, as in the case of some startups that have pitched for investment with no product, your traction may be evidence of the problem from existing customers who are screaming out for a solution. In this case, it was inventory management. They were small artisan businesses who were managing their inventory and their sales on spreadsheets and bits of paper, which were horribly inefficient, time-consuming and inaccurate. Uh, but they had a problem and they wanted it solved and these guys got their... Uh, $600,000 investment further down the road after they pitched without a product, but they had traction. Obviously the market, the business model, the team, the vision and ask. So define your business in these terms and that gives you a succinct pitch. This will lead you to around a one and a half to three minute pitch of only the essential information that answers the questions that investors want to know. Uh, and that's an exercise that you can do. It takes 10 minutes and you can keep refining it and you can keep adding to it and the more you do it, the better you get at it and then you test it. You road test it in your networking and um, uh, investor interactions uh, and interactions with that barbecues. People say, what are you working on? What are you doing? You'll get the usual questions. What are you doing? How does it work? Who, who's it for? You know, those usual questions and 
we can go into long rambling answers or we can be very concise. And it's applying discipline that'll get you to those concise answers. Um, quite simply in terms of process, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. And uh, when, what, what our goal is, is to achieve high performance, to do the very, very best we can. But our usual process is to do this, is to procrastinate for a really long time, and then to panic, and then to present. And you get there. You get there. But you don't do your best. You don't give your idea its best chance of success. So, let's take another look. Here is a painful process of preparing, I mean, procrastination and panic is painful, but this is also painful, but it's longer, it's the same time, it's the same time, it might be 10 minutes or 10 months, it doesn't matter. It's using the same time, but it's just starting early. And there's a process that we do with everything we do. With everything we do. It's this same process. You consider your options, you make decisions, and then you execute. But you don't present your decisions. You don't do that. Steve Jobs never did that. Once he had decided what the iPod pitch was going to be, then they spent time working on the slides, refining the script, practicing till he knew it off by heart, and then he was ready to present. And at the highest performance possible. We used to do this when we did comedy shows. We would think, oh my God, what are we going to write about? And we'd have three weeks set aside for rehearsal, and we'd get to the last week and we had no content. And like, oh my God, we opened in a week, we got nothing, we got one 10 minute sketch. You know? And then by the next week we had too much material as we sort of panicked. And it took us a while to realize that, you know, start, Without, we felt we had to make decisions and so we procrastinated because we weren't making decisions and we weren't doing anything. And so considering your options is the first thing. We do this all the time, uh, but it's a process that you apply to content development. And that's how you achieve high performance. So what are, you, what are we considering? This probably should be bigger, but I sort of think it looks nice, like that. So who's the audience? Who are our audience? Are they investors? Are they partners? Are they potential employees? Who is our audience? It's a different story for each group of people. They have different objectives. You have different objectives. You need to identify both of those. And if their objectives don't match your objectives, how are we going to find the middle ground that bring you both aligned? What is the central theme of your presentation? You know, you go to a movie. What was it about? It's the central theme, right? And then from the central theme, what are their objectives? What are my objectives? What are the messages that are going to reinforce that theme? And then how will I structure everything? Or what stories will I tell? These are the sort of things that we need to consider uh, and make decisions about. And going backwards here, I think this is probably the difficulty of... of um, public presentation is that this whole area here, even, even here, is private. We do all of this in private. And, and it's fantastic. It's, it, we can be very creative and we can be very, very absorbed. But the difficulty comes when we go into public and we stand up in front of people and we are very vulnerable and we express our ideas. That is difficult when we're not used to it, and it becomes so rewarding the more you do it, and the more you prepare well, and the more you have a great story to tell. Uh, so structure, the simplest structure I find is in music. Your theme is generally announced at the beginning of the music, whether it's with a single violin, or whether it's with an orchestral movement, or guitars and drums, or whatever but you're going to get the, the sense of the, the melodic theme at the beginning. That is explored throughout the middle, and then it's repeated at the end, probably in a different form, or sometimes returning to how it started. An elegant, circular um, structure. Uh, 
the classic beginning of presentations is uh, my name is and what I'm going to talk to you about today is and da 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 da. But a simple beginning which can be a statement or a quote or a statistic or an anecdote before you introduce yourself is a way of taking the audience's attention immediately at the beginning of a presentation. And that little opening hook, if you like, can be expressive of the theme, can introduce the theme that you're talking about. And that theme, of course, is the business opportunity. So being thoughtful about how you begin and how you end. Uh, and again, the beginning is where you bring the audience into your world. You, you take the audience from wherever they are into what you're thinking, you know, mentally um, establishing a, a line of communication into their heads. <laughs> And to begin in a, normal, in, in a normal way that most presentations begin with, it's nothing new. And so it's predictable. And so as soon as it's predictable, we, we lose attention because we know what's happening. Yeah? But when you begin with something different, something unique, something that is going to be explored later on that takes people by surprise. For example, my grandmother cannot read but she uses our app to order her gas and her water in Jakarta every day. And so suddenly you have a little anecdote that takes you into a space that you hadn't thought about. Uh, there's this guy in Singapore who has this company and he has raised $60 million in funding for various projects. And he distills some of his key messages into three. What is the opportunity? So if you think of the investor, or you think of the potential employee, or you think of the partner, what is the opportunity that you are presenting them with? Can you define it? What is the opportunity? What is it? And then this, why should I get excited? So that's the opportunity, why should I get excited? And that can be anything. I don't know what your ideas are, but what is the basic opportunity and if you're pitching to investors, for the investor. And why should they be excited about it? For example, if you're in eSports, this is an opportunity to enter a market that is growing at a furious rate. I don't know if you've seen the numbers about eSports, but they're just ridiculous. And when you're using your slides, a simple single message on each slide. And that doesn't necessarily mean a couple of words. It can be an image, it can be a, a, a photograph, it can be a graph, it can be a chart, but not multiple levels of information. Okay, I'm going to rush through these now, but this is the problem with slides. Okay. Slides ask you to begin a series of bullet points from the top left hand corner and populate the page with a load of bullet points. That's your script, that's not slides. Please don't do that to your audiences. You tell the story and your slides show what it is that you're talking about. It's a visual medium, okay? There's a group in Singapore that say slides should simplify and amplify your message. Okay, simplify and amplify. There are those countless research that tells you that people remember three to five things. Yeah, three to five things from a presentation. So what are those three to five things that you want them to remember and make sure that those points are very, very simple and easy to understand on your slides. Okay, this two slide decks is the same information, exactly the same information, except one was a pitch and one was the deck sent to the investors. Okay, this one is standalone. This one, all of the bridging information is told by the presenter. Same information, two decks. This uh, doc sent 200 pictures, there's a link there to that. This, is, this, this was basically their fundamental advice. Keep your deck to 20 pages or fewer. Each visit from people who are assessing that deck is less than five minutes, less than four minutes on an average. 
So the venture capitalists that receive your business plan are going like this, right? They're not reading it, they're not thinking, oh, this person spent so much time putting this together, I'm going to, play, I'm going to read every word and understand every difficult to understand concept. No, it doesn't happen. So in a pitch deck, uh, JFDI, part of Global Accelerator Network, Techstars, that's their template. Y Combinator's template. This is Sequoia's, what they're looking for out of, a, out of an investor deck. And DocSend, when they did their analysis of 200 uh, pitch decks, they um, uh, came up with, these are the common ones. That's the common one. So there's not a lot of difference between the two. Obviously, there's much more detail in the investor deck. So here's our information. And if we have a strong, clear statement and supporting information that is easy to flick through. So that when you flick through that first page of the slide or, or the, the deck that you're sending them, it's easy to understand that the problem is a coherent problem. Uh, the solution is a coherent solution. We don't need to go into too much detail. So for example, if it was the iPod, it could be as simple as this. What more do we need to understand to get the context of where this business opportunity is? Okay. So, if you get the chance, have a look at his 2009 iPhone launch, which is extraordinary in the way that he uses information to create a compelling argument. And he usual, uses visual references that are just extraordinary. Uh, and the choices they make. Uh, and then finally, to do a good pitch. <laughs> Prepare thoroughly. Know your stuff and know that you know your stuff. And prepare thoroughly is making a series of really good decisions. Take control of yourself, take control of your content, take control of the, the forum that you're in. Share your belief, uh, as Lee Kuan Yew shows, that you have, when, when you have this story that is only yours, you can actually communicate it with great uh, impact and uh, generate positive energy uh, to the people that you're talking to. I thank you very much. Okay.